Production of immense possibilities is made possible by the generous support of the Earth and Humanity Foundation. Wendy Selden. Rogue Co-ops, a community-centered collaboration among the Ashland Food Co-op, the Grange Co-op, Rogue Credit Union, and the Medford Food Co-op, Cliff Bar and Company, Elizabeth York, and these additional members of the Immense Possibilities Community Builders Circle. And this evening's program is underwritten by a special grant from the Harry and Yvonne Leonard Charitable Foundation. When a tree dies or leaves fall to the ground or an animal dies, it goes back into the soil. The decomposer communities in the soil recycle that material and create new life. We start to value it in a different way because we want to protect that habitat. We want to foster that life. We want to feed that ecosystem. It's kind of like an all-purpose elixir. There's nothing that can't be improved by adding compost to your soil. When I take kids outside, I find they tend to relax and kind of be themselves, and they're, they're, they're pretty happy in general, you know? It is very effective, and so it works for the kids. And of course, if the kids are doing well, then we're all doing well. And the magic happens. Mm. And all we have to do is participate. Welcome to our weekly visit with people who are creating immense possibilities for healthy communities, solutions to all kinds of challenges. If you watch our program regularly, you might have noticed that our so-called innovations and emerging possibilities are often grounded in fundamental principles that are older than any of us. Actually, grounded is a good word for this episode. Our guests look to the ground in their daily work, and what they discover can offer vital guidance for building healthy communities. When a tree dies or leaves fall to the ground or an animal dies, it goes back into the soil. The decomposer communities in the soil recycle that material and create new life. We would look to that as essentially a perfectly harmonized nutrient management system. Nothing in, nothing out. And the minute that we were able to use ancient sunlight in the form of oil as energy, all of the other rules went out the window. The fact that we have gone to a much more linear food system from fertilizer factory to landfill and that we have relied on this fossil energy which has allowed us to segment the food system even more. One of the outcomes is that we've created systemic erosion throughout the entire system and I'm not just talking about soil erosion, I'm talking about the erosion of wealth from communities, I'm talking about the erosion of jobs, I'm talking about the erosion of sovereignty of people being able to chart their own destiny. When we loop that system back together and when we internalize it and when we keep it more local. Um, we build transparency, we build human connections, we build durability. So let's find out how community leaders are going about reclosing the loop that was broken by the compelling convenience of oil and industrial scale agriculture. We have guests who are dedicated to the production of high quality soil from the products from the soil, sometimes with the help of an undervalued critter that's all around us. We begin the conversation with someone whose research and teaching on composting and vermiculture, sometimes called worm composting, is recognized around the world. She's Dr. Elaine Ingham, formerly of Oregon State University, formerly chief scientist with the Rodale Institute, and the founder of Food Soil Web Incorporated. Elaine, welcome to Immense Possibilities. We're happy to have you here. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. I want to start where you start some of your talks. What is the difference between soil and dirt, and why does it matter? Soil has life in it, and the foods to feed those organisms, and soil is aerobic material, whereas dirt is just the sand, the silt, the clay. It really doesn't contain any life. So the, the simple way to turn your dirt back into soil is to compost organic matter, and compost really is pure organic matter. We want to, first of all, make sure that we're putting in the proper mix of organic materials. So we're getting the woodies to support our fungi, the beneficial fungi in soil. We want to have the green materials, which support the bacteria, that mix of really beneficial bacteria. And we want a little bit of party food. That's the high nitrogen. That's the legumes or the manure. But you have to be very careful not to add too much because as the organisms start growing really fast and generating the heat to kill the pathogens in your compost material, um, if you go too hot, too long, those organisms will use up all the oxygen and then you go stinky, smelly, black, and you produce a massive amount of materials, compounds that will actually kill your plant. 
You know, I wonder when you talk about needing this part of this and this part of that, if some people look and say, wow, this is more work than I signed up for. If, you, if I can just throw my kitchen scraps together and come back and have good soil, I'm in. But I don't want to do too much work. Well, what do you say? Is it a lot of work? For the 10 to 15 days after you put a thermal compost pile together like that, yeah, you do have to monitor and you should end up in, um, having to turn three to maybe five times. But if you, if you don't really want to work that hard, then you put something else to work for you in that composting process. And those are called earthworms. We want those litter worms, the, um, the composting worms, if you will. And they can do the turning for you. So where are we generally in the large scale of American agriculture? Um, we've turned all of our soil into dirt. Um, when you realize that the Great Plains of the United States was once probably up around 25 to 30 percent organic matter in that soil, and today it's less than 1 percent. And until we find the will to make the compost and put that proper biology and the foods to feed that biology back into the soil, we are going to have more and more and more problems with our agriculture. Well, let me ask you the practical question about that. Composting is relatively small scale. People do it in their backyards. There are some neighborhood programs, some, a few municipal programs. But in America, we're talking obviously about many millions of acres. Is it possible? Do you have a practical vision where composting could scale up and at some point displace inorganic fertilizers over that kind of a landscape? Absolutely. And, and we are, in fact, already doing that. We have some composting operations already in the U.S. that are paying attention to the proper biology. And those places may produce um, 100,000 tons of compost a year. We just need more of them. What's the biggest obstacle to shift you're talking about back to organic soils? The people who have a vested interest in selling the pesticides and the inorganic fertilizers, they want to um, make it sound like um, this whole concept of, of making compost and using biology to put back into the soil to do what nature has done for the last, gosh, four billion years probably. Um, they want to make that sound like, oh, no, that's impossible. You can't possibly do that. It's going to cost too much money. Well, what it's you hear is science. Science has increased productivity so much. We're trying to feed the world, and we need to do that out of our laboratories and our chemicals. We're showing very clearly that we can actually increase yields, typically, as compared to the conventional systems if you get the biology back into the soil. Do you have resources for beginners at your website? And we'll be showing that address at the end of the show. Yes, we do. We have um, classes that we offer online as well. Dr. Elaine Ingham, it has been a pleasure meeting you and having you on Immense Possibilities. Thanks for your work. Thanks for your time today. And I appreciate having this opportunity. Thank you very much. When we backyard compost, we reduce the landfill space that's being taken up. We reduce the amount of methane that's being created. The compost that gets generated or created, when we work it into our soils, it helps reduce the amount of watering that we need to do. We can grow bigger, healthier plants that withstand pests and bugs. It helps hold water. It helps let go of water if you've got really clay soils. It's kind of like an all-purpose elixir. There's nothing that can't be improved by adding compost to your soil. Two Rogue Valley educators who are serious about worms and composting join me now. They are Rihanna Sims of the Southern Oregon Research and Extension Service and Jim Hartman, a teacher at Ashland High School. It's really good to have the two of you here. Hey, Thanks for coming. Jeff. Great to be here. Nice to see you. Well, Rihanna, what happens at Research and Extension around composting and worms? And is there growing interest in all this? Well, what happens at the Extension Service that's amazing is that we have this convergence of interests in soil and soil health. So people who have forests, people who have pasture land, people who have gardens, all realize that there's this common denominator of soil health that they really need to learn about. So we're seeing a real increase in demand about people learning about soils and wanting to know more in depth about what they can do to improve their soil. And compost is a centerpiece of that, I take it. How, how is that so? Where, what is the role of compost in the, in the big picture? Well, to me, the role of compost is really um, giving your soil a boost in the biology, in the life in the soil that's actually making the nutrients available. So you basically are taking organic waste, 
You're combining it in a way that lets the microbes in the soil eat as much as they possibly can. And through those interactions, they create an incredibly nutrient-rich soil amendment. Jim, how much work is composting? Well, you know, I, I put it together in a, a song. I won't sing it for you right now, but basically it's, uh, it's uh, one part green to two or three parts brown in general. And browns are stuff that is dried up and green is fresh. Uh, in terms could of be the, the same material, but at different. Uh, yeah, it could be like, for example, uh, fresh cut grass would be a green, but after it dries out, then it's a brown and the same thing with leaves. And you want to add a little bit of moisture, but not too much. And if, if it does get too much moisture, uh, it could go anaerobic, which means there's no oxygen, and it will really start to stink. If you do get that gooey, black, smelly stuff, can you fix it? Can you make it right? Definitely. Like if I had gooey black uh, stuff, and let's say I had a tumbling composter, I would just add more browns and just turn it. You know, it probably has too much moisture is what's going on. Now, Elaine said if you don't want to do as much work, there's another way to do this. It's worms. Wor get worms yeah. to do the work. Yeah. Tell us about it. Jeff, that. I brought you some worm compost. <laughs> just for you to see today. Excellent. Because there is so much life in this material that it's incredible. Basically, how do you start with worms? You take a five gallon bucket, drill some holes in the bottom and in the top. You need food scraps, that's what they're gonna eat. They also need bedding, so the, like the dry material Jim talked about, shredded paper, shredded paper, food scraps, shredded paper, a little native soil because they need the stones and their gizzards. Pretty fluffy. You, you want to make sure it doesn't pack For down. air, exactly. And so then you put, you've got your composting worms that eat organic material. Literally six weeks later, you have this type of beautiful soil. Um, it's called castings. It's actually worm, worm manure. And it is, has the nutrients ready now and that's what makes it so special. People do this in apartments or small suburban houses? Yes, and it's so easy and the best way to problem solve it is to smell it and I really encourage you to smell this Jeff okay. because so, it doesn't smell like poop. We can say that right? You can say that. It <laughs> should smell neutral. Mm -hmm. It should, should smell like a forest floor mm -hmm. and those are actually the soil microbes that you're smelling. You're smelling the life in the soil. So if it stinks or it smells like poop, something's gone wrong. And that's where you do a little troubleshooting, add a little extra shredded paper, and you should be good to go. But uh -huh. at the Extension Service, we offer classes and a lot of details um, if people want to know more. But it's so easy, and it's really fun. It's great for kids, and you can fit it right under your sink like we do at home. And you make some of the best soil amendment or fertilizer there is. So you do this with kids. Do you find kids uh, immediately attracted to, well, which parts of this? I, I guess I'd say with the critters and organisms, they love that, you know, even, you know, they've got this inner child that loves to see the bugs go everywhere and they just can't believe it and it's incredible. And, you know, if you throw in a microscope or a, a, a stereoscope, it gets even better. Well, I think worms is a great, is a great start. You know, it's, it's fun to watch. It's, they, um, it happens really fast and they can, um, you know, people can move forward really quickly and have a great end product easily. And so just by having that paper scraps and food waste, they create something really usable, um, really valuable. Fairly quickly you get from shredded newspaper to, uh, to this? Yes, and you know what? Worm compost costs about $50 a gallon. There's a value to this. There's, and the, in the Rogue Valley, especially where people are working to be self-sufficient, they don't. They know that it's not a good idea to put their food scraps in the trash. They know that there's another option. This is a great way for people to get started. You know that they can they can use two different waste products and create something that really has value. Is there a larger understanding about the world that you're trying to impart to kids through teaching composting? You know, I, I guess kids today, they do spend a lot of time with their smartphones, you know, and hooked into computers. Uh, when I take kids outside, I find they tend to relax and kind of be themselves, and they are, they're, they're pretty happy in general, you know. Uh, and I'd say that in general, nature is right out there. You can connect with it. It's infinite, and composting is one way to experience that. And then if you do the whole cycle where you're taking the compost and combining it with plants, uh, you know, then it's, it's just a very good therapy. It helps them feel grounded. Rayanna, I know from having you on the show before, you, you're someone who sees the big picture. 
What is the big picture that people get a glimpse of through, through this kind of work? Yeah, the big picture to me is about once, once we, that life is observable. We, can, we know intuitively that when soil has life, that there's an incredible potential there. We start to value it in a different way because we want to protect that habitat. We want to foster that life. We want to feed that ecosystem. And so we see once you have the value system, like Jim talked about, that it's just a priority not to put your food scraps in the garbage, you start to problem solve what system can work best for you and realizing that it's not hard and that nature is doing it already. We're learning from nature that you just pile these materials together, some, some dry materials, some green, two parts brown, one part green, and the magic happens. Mm. And all we have to do is participate. Brianna, what is the immense possibility of the work you do of teaching and spreading the word about soil building? I love it that you asked this question to your guests, and I've been thinking about it. And I think the immense possibility is that we tap into our primal knowing of healthy soil. It makes us fall in love again with the natural process that happens around us that makes soil viable to create life and that our life is dependent on that. And the immense possibility of people recognizing that ripples out in all directions. Rihanna Sims of Southern Oregon Research and Extension and Jim Hartman of Ashland High School, thanks for the word you're spreading here. This is pretty basic stuff. I'm really glad to, to have you on the program. Yeah. Thanks so Thank much, you. this was fun. You know, if you just think about these four simple things that a good compost needs, it needs a source of nitrogen, which is typically our grass clippings and our food scraps. It needs a source of carbon, which is typically our leaves and our shredded paper and straw and maybe even wood chips or sawdust. It needs air because we want to encourage the growth of aerobic organisms. And then we want to water everything down so that it's as moist as a wrung out sponge. So as long as we have carbon, nitrogen, air, and water, you should be good to go. Now we get to meet two of Jim Hartman's students, Jordan Paz Novak, who is a senior at Ashland High, and Carlene Martin, who's a junior, and we're really glad to have the two of you here. Yeah, Jordan, let me ask you, what are you learning in Mr. Hartman's class? What, what's it called, and w w big picture, what's it all about? We learn a lot about composting, uh, mostly, right now. Um, how to compost, how to compost correctly, what to use so that it's not a bad compost, um, stuff like that. Uh, we do some gardening. We planted some seeds, uh, cabbage, peas, um, stuff like that, kale, some mustard. And we've actually been watching those grow. That's really cool. Let me ask you, Carlene, is this all new to you or do you have a background? Have you, have you gardened and composted before? Well, I've never really experienced gardening, gardening and composting. This is pretty much the first time I have ever composted and gardened. And so I'm wondering why you chose this. It's an elective, right? You're not required to take this class. What, what caused you to say, I think I'd like to give that a try? Well, because it was more like outdoors and like hands-on, and I'm, I really enjoy having like hands-on activities and being outdoors, and I thought this class was pretty good to do for me. I really liked um, doing was feeding the composter because it was um, something new and I have never tried it before and I'm always up for something new. And this was an opportunity of, for me to try something new and composting, I've heard about it many times but I have never done it before so I thought that was pretty cool, feeding the composter. And it's really good for kinetic learners. I'm not actually a kinetic learner but I find that like feeling things and like feeling the soil and actually like doing that like touching the things you're learning helps a lot. I'm like really into this class, so I show my parents, look at what I'm doing in, what, in how class. How do they react? What do they think about it? They think it's really interesting. They're glad that I'm learning something new and, it, and something fun that I have a lot of hands on. I wonder if it's changing any food habits in either of your houses. What do you think? I'm eating a lot more veggies this year. Uh, I don't know if it's because of this class or not, but Mr. Hartman has definitely taught us about fruits and veggies and the importance in, of them in our diet, so. Tell, talk to me about worms a little bit. Mr. Hartman was saying that almost all students are pretty fascinated by them from the start. Is everybody up for that or do some people start out going, I don't think so, thanks anyway? 
myself, I don't really like worms because they're all like, you know, slimy and dirty and stuff, but watching them is pretty cool. So someone called it magic, what they do. Does it, does it feel just, do you, do you like checking in every couple of days and seeing the changes? Yeah, it's pretty cool what they do actually. They are very essential to our ecosystem. Uh, the way they put, as she said, life into the dirt. It's pretty true. I'm wondering if this class gives you a sense about the big picture. I mean, yes, it's about composting and there's some worms and you're gardening. And what comes out of it in terms of a bigger understanding of the way things work? Well, the way I think of it, climate change is a huge issue right now. And little things that a community can do to help prevent climate change is really good. And so composting is one of those things. Cause why, why is that exactly? It prevent or it uh, produces less CO2 than just throwing away your food scraps would produce. It also helps your fruits and veggies and stuff so that you can actually like um, help support yourself with a garden, maybe. And I think it's pretty cool that we learn more things than what he teaches us because we can take it with us. And the connections yeah. between things too. I can take some of the lessons that Mr. Hartman has taught us with me when I'm older and I will understand more about the earth and can start my own composting too. How about you, Jordan? You think this is shaping your, your path at all? Yeah, um, you have to have a career that you actually enjoy to be happy and learning about this stuff, how fun it can actually be to garden and to compost and plant things and help the environment is definitely reaffirming my, um, my goal. It's not very hard to learn, anyone can really do it. You can go out into your garden and start composting, start planting things, and you'll have fun. Well, Jordan Paz Novak and Carlene Martin, thanks for telling us what you're learning in school. It's uh, pretty cool stuff, and I appreciate hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You might remember last season's episode about the ambitious and adventuresome environmental education program that's taken root in the tiny rural school district of Pinehurst, Oregon. We talked then to the originator and coordinator of that program, Pinehurst Middle School teacher Jim Impara. This generation will share the planet with nine billion people. And uh, part of what they'll need to be able to figure out is how we're gonna allocate these resources in the environment itself. And uh, if they're intimate with that environment, uh, then they can make truly intelligent and humane decisions. Jim Impara has come into town again to join us and update us on his activities. Jim, welcome back to Immense Possibilities. Thank you. Give us again a thumbnail sketch of what it is you created up in that, in that middle school of yours. The first thing, of course, where we live, we live in an environment where the environment screams for us to come out and be a part of that, gets the kids outdoors, uh, it's, and it also makes it something that everything can relate back to. Uh, so it takes a little of the abstraction out of it but, and makes it a little more concrete to make a connections as you write or do math or do the science. You were with us a little over a year ago. What, what's happened since then? We were studying basin and range now. However, we had an enormous fire, which kind of reset us a little bit there. So we spent a good part of the beginning of this school year going out into the Oregon Gulch fire and seeing what's happening out there. That's a pretty dramatic setting for very teaching dramatic. about <laughs> yes, forest ecology. Yes, yes, very much so. Uh, we had a lot of help from the BLM. In fact, um, uh, they guided us out there a couple of times. We went up to the fire tower, and um, as part of community service, we overseeded some of the areas that had been burned in the wilderness area. Now, you have, you're in a very small independent school district without a large tax base. You know, funding schools in the best of cases is a challenge these days. If someone's out there going, well, how do they afford a luxury like environmental education, what would you say? Well, first, I wouldn't call it a luxury. It's a very effective uh, way to teach, and uh, we can, any way you want to do it, you can come visit us and see how the children react in the classroom, and if you get into numbers, you can look at state test scores. Again, the school was in the top 10% or the level 5, um, so it's not a luxury necessarily. We're very fortunate. We have a very supportive community. Why do you keep pouring so much personal energy into sustaining this program? Well, I'm probably not allowed to say it's fun, uh, but it, it is very effective, and so it works for the kids. And, of course, if the kids are doing well, then we're all doing well. Jim and Para, you've done something really important up there on that mountain. Thank you very much for, for doing it and for letting us know about it on immense possibilities. Thank you for having me.
We can look back to the more traditional approaches that we've always taken and that ecosystems have taken forever because we know they work. Last week we told you that we're searching for short original films about immense possibilities we don't even know about yet. Here is a quick taste from some we've already received. Where we can offer scholarships and an opportunity to get that coveted high school diploma. We weren't extremists. We were just people trying to set things right just like in the civil rights era and in so many movements before. Just like in those other struggles, the most amazing people alive. And we're definitely looking for more, so tell friends who might want to submit a film to find out how at our website, immensepossibilities.org. You can also visit our Facebook page and like and share it. We're really glad you watched tonight. I'm Jeff Golden. Until next time, please do what you can do. Thanks for watching to learn about tonight's immense possibility. You can watch any of our past programs anytime at immensepossibilities.org.